Time for a checkup. We're going to transition, and we're going to do this new series. Ever, ever, ever do a checkup? You know what I'm talking about, that, that annual physical that your, your, you know, your doctor wants you to do, your general practitioner say, hey, I want you to come in, and, and hey, we're going, to check, we're going to check things. We're going to make sure you're tracking well. We're going to make sure your weight's where it should be, that your blood's where it should be, that you don't have sugar developing or cholesterol or, or high blood pressure, or we're going to get in front of some things that might be presenting itself in this season of your life. You ever done that? A couple of you have done that. Uh, the rest of you I'm concerned about. Uh, maybe, maybe some of you go to the dentist, right? And uh, you know, maybe you do that once a year, once a decade. The point is you need to go. And when you go, right, they, they, they're going to they're gonna kind of scrape your teeth. They're going to clean them. They're going to look to see if there's any fillings, if there's any breaks, if there's anything that needs to be fixed. Because we all know that we go to the dentist when something goes wrong. But, but it's really good to do that preventative maintenance, right? And, and to go in and to check and make sure your teeth are healthy, your gums are healthy, all that good stuff. You ever gone to your financial advisor and do a financial checkup? Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but there's, there's some of us that understand that I want to see how my 401ks and my, or my uh, you know, IRAs or, or my investments are doing. I want to see if I'm meeting my financial objectives, my financial goals. Am I trending the way I should? Should I get in on the market, out of the market? Should I go to bonds? Should I do security? Should I do this? Should I do that? And so you, you do a little checkup, making sure you're getting ready for your retirement goals. Or if you're in retirement, are we go, is my money going to last? And so you're making these decisions, and you do it how? Because of checkups, right? Maybe you take your car in for, you know, some servicing. We'd call it, you know, a, a, an oil change or whatever. And you're, you're giving it a little bit of a checkup, looking at what might be going on, what might not be going on. Hey, have you ever done a job review? Job review. You go to the job, and, and once a year, they're going to sit down. They're going to say, hey, are you meeting your goals? Have you hit your objectives? Uh, uh, do we still like you? Do you still like us? And they're going to they're going to kind of run you through that process, right? And you, you learn an assessment. You see how they're looking at you and how you're looking at them and, and what the objectives and initiatives are. And you're making sure things are lined up. It's all checkup based, right? And these, these checkups are necessary. They're important. They're critical to our general health and our general well-being. And, and if you'll remember, at the beginning of 2019, we made a declaration to the church. And the declaration, I believe, from the Lord was 2019 is a year of health and wholeness, right? And so now we're halfway through the year, and guess what we're doing? A checkup. Because how are you tracking spiritually? And not just spiritually, but how are we understanding health and wholeness as the context of our whole life? Sure, we want to think about our lives spiritually, but we also want to look at our lives in every other way. And because we have, because everybody needs a checkup. Everybody needs one. Because too many of us, if I say, hey, how you doing? Where are things? Most of us will go to the subjective. We'll say, well, I think things are good. You know, it feels good to me. Marriage feels good until your wife hands you divorce papers. Right? Or I think our finances are pretty good, and then pretty soon you discover, I don't have a job tomorrow. Or, you know, you, you, you start thinking about, you know, I, I feel I feel all right, but then your doctor says, well, your cholesterol's up, or your blood pressure's high, or you're, you know, you're, you're starting to track diabetically. And then all of a sudden, you, maybe I'm not as good as I felt I was. Because we all have these kind of subjective trackers for how we relate to our general health. The problem is they're subjective. It's based on a thing called emotion. It's based on a thing called a basically uninformed perspective. And so when we do checkups, we get markers, things that identify what we're doing, how we're doing it, and how well we're tracking towards those things. And so things like, like every day, like right now I'm, I'm getting ready for world competition again, and so you know what I'm doing every day? I'm standing on a scale. Because that scale, I, 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 could, sit, I could get up in the morning and I say, you know, I feel lighter. I sprung out of bed a little quicker. So, you know, but when I stand on that scale, that scale doesn't have any emotions. Right? It just, it, just, it just presents the reality that I have to deal with. Have I gained weight? Have I lost weight? I shouldn't have had that donut this morning at church. You know, whatever the context is. And so we all need a checkup. Why? Because God has a job for us. And, and our general health will determine our usefulness. And I don't want you to just think about your spiritual health. If God has a job, if, if, I'm, if I'm broken down financially, I can't do what I need to for God. 
If I'm broken down emotionally, I can't do what I need to do for God. If I'm broken down relationally, it's going to hinder where I go and what I can accomplish with God. Is anybody getting the, getting the point here? So our general health is critical to the values of our lives. So we're going to start with a verse, and this is going to be kind of our key verse as we move through these few weeks together. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, look what it says. Examine yourselves. How many love that word? Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourself. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Now, I love these two words, exam and test. They're essentially the same word in Greek. And the idea here is, is there's this idea of I'm checking up. I'm looking in. I'm not just taking for granted that things are going well. I'm looking at things in a critical way. I'm looking at, a way, in, at things in an informative way. And I'm using other measurements or clear measurements to determine whether I really am where I think I am. Right? Now, I love the way the message version says it. So we're going to read this one because this one kind of brings it back to where we are. Test yourselves, right, to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular. Oh, come on. I need more than three of you to say it. Give yourselves regular. Let's try that one more. Give yourselves regular. So who's doing the checkup? You are, right? You're submitting yourself to a process of checking yourself out. Now look what it says next. It says, you need firsthand evidence, evidence, not subjective, evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. Prove it. If you fail the test, do something about it. And everybody said, amen. All right, you, now you know what to do. you got to do something about it. I love this verse because what it says to you and I is that God is not responsible for our general health. We are. You are responsible to make sure you are where you're supposed to be. Now, I'll give you an example. I, I, my doctor's here to testify of this. I, I was, I, about five years ago, I went to the doctor for my regular checkup. I was probably 60 to 80 pounds overweight. I can't remember what number it was. But I was way overweight. I was, uh, I was my cholesterol was off the charts. My blood pressure was starting to creep on me. I was pre-diabetic. And I looked at him, I said, but I feel okay. <laughs> right? I didn't feel okay. And I knew I didn't feel okay. But I didn't want to be honest with it, right? And so as he started kind of running down the list of all my issues, he said, well, you know, your cholesterol is really high. Well, there's a pill for that. And, you know, your blood pressure is starting to creep. Well, there's a pill for that. Right? You're overweight. Okay. But then he said, you're pre-diabetic. And something in my brain, right there in that moment, said, I ain't going there. Something in me clicked, and I said, I am not going there. And instead of thinking, the doctor's going to fix it, the doctor's going to give me a pill for it, I, you know, I, I'm going to medicate this thing, and I'm going to control it. As soon as he said, you're pre-diabetic, you know what I said? What do I got to do? Immediately I said, I've got to do something. I got to take responsibility for my health. So you know what he told me? He said, he, he was very gentle. He's very kind. But he said, you got to lose weight. You need to get off your derriere. It's French for your bottom. You have to live a sedentary life. You're, you're, sitting, in, you're sitting, you're eating food, and you're sitting on your, you're in your desk. You're, you're, you're not exercising. You got to exercise, and you got to change your diet. So you know what I did? I immediately started doing that. It wasn't long after that I lost the weight. Right now I'm 60, 70 pounds less than I used to be, right? Getting ready to compete in world competition. I'm healthy. Everything in my life's under control. God's good. I'm not diabetic. Thank you, Jesus. Right? But because somebody, somebody had to say, these are your markers, and if you don't do something about it now, you're going to pay bigger dividends on the back end. I'll give you another little story that kind of identifies this. Uh, the Bible wants you to examine yourself. I love, this, I love this idea of exam, right? We all know what it means. It means to test. Exam, to test, endeavor, scrutinize, right? Discipline, inspect carefully in order to evaluate the general health of something, right? It also is the way that we determine the cause of what's breaking down. 
right? We test it to see why is it breaking down? Why isn't it working? And it gives us indicators. So once again, we need checkups or exams or tests. How many love the idea of a test? That's what I thought. Nobody likes testing, <laughs> except for teachers that lifted their hands, of course. If you're an educator, I love tests. Right? Because, because te- you know, what do we know about testing? Listen, I've, I've done enough tests to know, because how many here have gone to school? It, I'll tell you, the last crowd, last, this first service, they had me super concerned. None of them went to doctors. None of them went to do- dentists. None of them went to financial advisors. None of them had jobs. <laughs> Thankfully, they went to school. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I, remember, uh, I remember being at the test, you know, being tested. Now, here's the thing about tests. And the Bible tells us, by the way, and Pastor Charity did a beautiful job last week talking about it. The Bible tells us that tests are inevitable. In fact, we're not supposed to consider it strange when we're tested. Or that it's unusual when we're tested. Here's what I know about a test. A test is the wrong time to ask for answers. Come on, anybody. I actually tried this out one time because I did what some of you did. When I found out there was a test, I tried to devour all of the information in a 24-hour period. Right? We called it cramming. It meant I didn't pay attention all, all that whole process. So I want you to understand that testing is always about determining how well you're assimilating what's being downloaded to you. Right? So I want to ask you a question and think about this. What's being downloaded to you in this season of your life? Pay attention to it because you're going to get tested on it. Pay attention to what seems to be the focus of what you're tracking and what's being assimilated and what you're always hearing. Pay attention to it because a test is coming. And a test isn't a bad thing. It's proving how well you've assimilated the information, right? Right? So I tried this one day, one day at school. I'm sitting there, and I, I, I got the test, and I knew none of the answers. <laughs> Must have been studying the wrong things. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I lifted my hand. I said, teacher, I need help. And so she came. She said, what do you need help with? I said, well, this, this question right here, yes. I said, I don't know the answer. <laughs> she says, and? Well, would you give it to me? <laughs> you have not because you asked not. Come on. Would you give it to me? And she goes, no. You should have studied this. I, well, I know, but I, I, I didn't. It was interesting how none of my excuses worked on her. None of them. None of them worked. Right? I, I, you can imagine how I scored on that test poorly. And uh, then I had to repeat the material. And that's the problem with tests, right? If we don't pass, we repeat. And some of you are still taking the same test and thinking it's the devil. No, it's just because you ain't paying attention. I'm going to tell on my mother-in-law just because she's my mother-in-law. Here's something. She's wonderful, wonderful woman. But uh, a few years ago, she wanted to to vote in the the next presidential general election, the last presidential general election. And, but she had to get her license changed, her driver's license changed. So we, I took her down to the DMV, and we went there, and she went through the whole process. And they said, okay, put your, put your eyes in the cylinder and read, read the stuff on the screen. And she did that. And, and they said, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, we can't issue you a driver's license because you, you, you didn't pass the eye exam. Oh, no, I, I've been driving. I'm fine. I can see. She said, you cannot drive no more from this day forward. <laughs> You know, and, and you're going to, you, you can't, uh, you know, you've got to go to your optometrist. You've got to get an exam. They've got to correct the situation. Once they correct it, then you can come back. We'll, we'll know that it's been corrected, and we'll give you your license. And so, and so I had to take her to the optometrist a few days later, and I take her in there, and I'm sitting in the waiting room, and all of a sudden one of the aides come out, and they say, would you come back, please? I thought, oh, Lord, what's going on here? I've never been called back in an optometrist visit. So I walk back there, and there's my mother-in-law sitting in a little chair, and they've got the room darkened. they got the lit-up screen on the wall, you know, the one with the big E at the top. She go, and he goes, uh, I just want you to see this. Ma'am, could you read the top line? She said, what line? <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't read the E. She was legally blind. Now, she had huge cataracts. That was the problem. But she had been driving for years. So we are all alive by the grace of God. 
my, my, my point here is, is it was testing. See, she thought she was fine. If you talked to her, she was perfect. Oh, I can see great. And it was interesting. I'd walk into the house, and she would be reading her Bible with no glasses. But I think it was just, I don't know, spiritual, <laughs> spiritual something going on. I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, we got the cataracts corrected. She now drives. She can see. Thank you, Jesus. The point is, you need an exam. You got to test it. You got to determine the general health of things. So here's the question. Here's the question that you're going to hear when you go to your doctor, when you go to your optometrist, when you go to your financial advisor, when you go to your counselor, when you go to your, your employer, this is the thing you're going to hear. One of the very first things you're going to hear. How you doing? So we're halfway through our proclamation of a year of health and wholeness, and I'm asking you the question, how you doing? You made some decisions in January. How you doing? You set some goals in January, February. How you doing? Oh, yeah, we're making you accountable. Because it's important for us. How you doing spiritually? How you doing emotionally? How you doing in your attitude? How you doing in your relationship? How you doing in your finances? Are you tracking? Are you hitting the goals? Is the trend line changing? Was it going one direction and now it's going the other direction? And, and we need to commit ourselves to this idea that I'm not just going to get there because we heard a nice little sermon series and I made a decision about it several months ago. It's I've got to track this thing. I've got to do regular checkups. And we're going to learn about this over the next several weeks. But, but we learned at the very beginning, and I'm not going to re-preach this. I just want to reintroduce it to you. There are three general fundamental principles for health. What are they? Diet, exercise, and rest, right? Diet is simply this, the quantity and quality of what we consume. You see, our health is never going to improve if we consume the wrong things. Our mental health, will, our emotional health will never improve if we're still consuming the day, same doubts, the same fears, the same anxieties, the same stresses. We've got to change our diet. Come on. And sometimes we just ate way too many soap operas and not enough word. Come on, sometimes we're spending too much time on CNN and Fox uh, to have any peace in our soul. We're consuming all the wrong things and too much of the wrong things, and the consequences are disastrous. Is anybody listening to me? If you want to change your trajectory, you've got to change what you're eating, what you're allowing into your brain, what you're allowing into your spirit, what you're allowing into your body, what you're allowing into your finances, what you're allowing out of your finances. And anybody tracking with me? You have got to take control of the relational context of your life. Why? Listen, young people, the top three, four, five people in your life are determining your trajectory. If you're hanging with the wrong people, you're going in the wrong direction. If you're hanging with the right people, come on, consume the right relationships, consume the right kind of declarations, consume the right kind of information, and it will change your life. Yeah. Second one, exercise, right? Exercise. It's just simply how we exert ourselves with healthy activity that brings us into personal well-being. Now, when I say exert, I'm talking about energy. I've learned something as I'm now approaching 58 years old. I'm learning that I have X amount of energy, right? And, and I've got to decide how I'm going to use it. And too many of us are using our energy to respond and to react to crisis. We are expending all of our energy in crisis. All of our energy managing everybody else's stuff, my stuff, all the stuff that's being laid on my plate, all the stuff that's being sent my way, and we're sitting there constantly using our energy, trying to hold things together and pull things here and take things from there, and we're not being proactive, we're being reactive. The consequence of being reactive is you end up exhausted, you end up stressed out, you end up broken down, you end up dysfunctional. But I'm asking you to change your, pro your activity into proactivity, I want you to begin to set some goals, uh, set some standards, uh, set some plans in place, uh, and begin to move. Uh, use your energy uh, in the right direction. Use your spiritual energy in the right direction. Use your relational energy. Use your emotional energy in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And then the final piece is rest, right? Rest. We all know what rest is. It's recovery and refreshing. that comes from quiet time, tranquil time, moments of peace. And I want to say something to you. The first two, diet and exercise, the things you control. Rest is the thing that God controls. It's the thing you're trusting God with. Because listen, no matter, listen, how many know I can do whatever I want, need to do for my physical well-being, but some things are genetic. 
I don't have control over that. I can eat all the right things. I can do all the right things and still have diabetes. So how do I, how do I fix that? Well, I can't fix that. I've got to trust God. I do all I can. God does the rest. That's where rest comes in. And too many of us, I, I've done everything I can with my kids. There's got to be something more I can do. Yeah, there's one more thing you can do. Rest. Trust God with the stuff you can't fix. Trust God with the stuff that you can't change. Trust God with the stuff that keeps you up at night. Trust God with the stuff that keeps you stressed out during the day. Start trusting God with the stuff. Rest in the Lord. Right? It's just that simple. It's just that simple. And God will give you peace. So rest. So diet, exercise, rest. Say that with me. Diet, exercise, rest. This isn't, this isn't rocket science, folks. This isn't big revelational stuff. So what I want to do today is I want to, I want to lay the ground for work for why we need checkups, if you haven't figured that out yet. Why do we need a checkup? Why should we do this regularly? Why should you determine checkups in your spiritual life and every other component of your life? Why should you do it on a regular basis? So let, let's start with a person that needed a checkup, and because he didn't check himself up, turned into a huge disaster. Now, I'm going to describe him. You all know him. It's, it starts in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And, and here's my point. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man that was a king chosen by God, highly anointed, the writer of the majority of the Psalms, right? He was a man that loved and abided in the presence of God. He was creative. He was a leader's leader. He was a man that was admired, extolled, celebrated, and God himself celebrated him. He was the man that God put forward as the one that would become the line by which his son, Jesus, would come into the earth. I mean, come on. If anybody's got it going for him, David's got it going for him, right? But I don't care who you are, what your genes are, what your spiritual pedigree is, we still need checkups. So let's, let's start reading the story. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab. Now, Joab was his general. And the Israelite army to fight the Amorites, <clears throat> Ammonites, excuse me. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So we immediately see that there's something going wrong in David. Because he's abdicating his responsibility as a king. When all the other kings are fighting, David's at home. When all the other kings are doing what kings do, leading their armies, taking their responsibility, being at the forefront, doing the job that he had been advocated and anointed and empowered to do, instead of doing that, he's sitting at home in Jerusalem. The result of that is late one afternoon after his midday rest, so instead of fighting battles, he's snoozing. 40 years old, and he's taking afternoon naps. David got out of bed, and was walking on the roof of the palace because he ain't got nothing better to do. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a porn site. Oh, I'm sorry. As he's searching YouTube, all of a sudden ended up on the wrong channel. He noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Instead of hiding his eyes in shame, realizing he shouldn't be going there, he sent someone to find out who she was. He was told she's Bathsheba. Now he's thinking, hey, listen, I'm the king. Like what I see. You know, hey, I can add her to my harem of 22 other wives. This is, this is good. This is good. This works out for me. Finds out she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eli Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uh-oh, danger, Will Robinson. Danger, Will Robinson. She's off the market. She's married. It's interesting how in our current culture, marriage really doesn't mean anything. And David had that attitude. Or maybe not. Well, let's look. Next verse. Then David sent messengers to get her. <laughs> he doesn't take the, listen, instead of, saying, instead of turning his eyes away, instead of doing what he's supposed to do, taking the responsibility, walking in his previous convictions, I tell you, instead of taking afternoon naps and walking on his veranda, he should have been in the presence of God if he wasn't out there fighting his battles, praying for his armies, praying for his people, standing in the, come on, in the war room. Instead of doing that, he's at a life of leisure. He's not walking in the conviction of his calling. And so he sends messengers to get her, and she came to the palace, and he slept with her. Well, the story doesn't end there. Sends her home. A few weeks later, 
He gets a message from Bathsheba. They didn't have texts or anything, but let's just assume they had, you know, the, the most modern iPhone, and she texts him. You know, hidden text, secret message. I'm pregnant. What does David do? He doesn't fall on his face, doesn't repent, doesn't go to the Lord, doesn't change anything. You know what he decides to do? He decides to cover it up. So he calls Uriah the Hittite off the battlefield. He brings him in. He says, Uriah, so there's a Captain King thing going on. They're talking for a little bit. He's befriending him. Hey, what's it going? Hey, I appreciate all you're doing. You're an amazing man. But listen, if anybody deserves a break, you deserve a break. So I, well, listen, take, take some R&R on the king. Take some R&R. Spend some time with your family. Rest a little bit. Relax. Refresh. Then we'll send you back to your responsibilities. Because when you're in a bad place with God, you think what you do in your bad place is what everybody else should do in their bad place. And so what he does, he sends him back. But you know, Uriah's a man of honor and conviction and commitment and responsibility. And he's like, I can't go and spend the night with my wife when my men are dying on the battlefield. And, and if I still got to maintain my responsibility. So you know what he does? He sleeps with the king's guard at the king's gate. Why? Because if I can't protect the king and the, my kingdom at the, at the battlefield, I'll protect it at home by guarding my king's house. Well, David hears about it a couple days later. And he's like, calls Uriah up. Yo, Uriah, come on, man. Listen, let me set you up. I'm going to send my chefs. I'm going to send some stringed instruments, some candlelight, some surf and turf. Let's, let's set the atmosphere. Let's, come on, it's all on me. Let, you need to go on back to the house. So here's Uriah. He's walking back to the house, and the music's playing, and the candles are glowing. And, 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 and he's like, I can't do it. i got to protect the king. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta sacrifice. I gotta do what I can do for make sure the security and the safety of my nation. So he goes back to the king's gate. Guess what the king does? Now, how many knows he's not in the presence of God right now? Does this sound, does this sound like a, a, a man after God's own heart? Well, listen to what he does next. He writes a message. He puts it in Uriah's hand. Uriah then takes that message, sealed message, to Joab the general. And when Joab opens it in the presence of Uriah, it says. I want you to send Uriah to the front of the battlefield where it's the hottest, and when it gets really bad, I want you, all the other men to pull back so he'll die. Uriah delivers the, his own message of death to the man that's going to execute him. So what happens? Uriah pulls it, pulls it off. He does it. Or excuse me, Joab does it. The message is sent back to David. David goes, Phew. boy, that's settled. Doesn't this sound like a man after God's own heart? Doesn't this sound like a man who's walking in the presence of God? Doesn't this sound like a man that's called and anointed and gifted and graced, singing those songs, writing those tunes? Doesn't this sound like that man? You know what he does? He doesn't mourn. He doesn't weep. He doesn't cry. He calls for Bathsheba. He says, let's get married. Let's cover this bad boy up. I need my reputation maintained. Because when you're disconnected, from a healthy perspective of who you are and what you're called to do, you be, get more interested in your own reputation than what's right. And so he does that. He, he marries her, and sure enough, a few months later, a baby's born. So they have a baby shower party, a naming party. They're all there at the palace, and they're singing, and they're shouting, and they're dancing. My, I just, the king has a new son. We have a new prince in the land. This is awesome. Woo! And then one of the local religious leaders Comes in, his name's Nathan. He walks up. Man, I'm so glad you're here for this great festive occasion. Man, I, I, I hope you can bless my son. It's going to be a great day in Israel. Nathan said, you know, I, I, I just need to share with you what's on my heart. Sure, what's going on? Well, uh, there's this rich man in town, and he's got everything. He's got herds, he's got flocks, and he's got money, he's got resources. And there's a, a guy that's his next-door neighbor, and he's poor. He has nothing except for one single lamb. And that lamb's like a, like a pet. That lamb is, plays with his kids, drinks from his cup, sleeps at the end of his bed. He's nurtured and cuddled and honored. It's, it's a, a family pet. It's a, a member of the family. And you know, you know what happened? The rich man had a guest come to his house, and instead of taking one of his flocks and herds, he went over and stole that man's one sheep and he killed that sheep and he offered it as meal to his guest. And David's hearing this and man, his cackles are rising. I mean, he's getting red-faced. He's getting angry. He sees the injustice in this. He sees the unfairness in this. He sees the unrighteousness in this. And all of a sudden, he's boiling. He says, that man will be, you tell me who that guy is. He'll be dead by this day tomorrow and he's gonna pay back fourfold what he stole. 
And Nathan steps back and points his finger at David and said, you're that man. God gave you the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. God called you to the highest calling. God established your throne forever. God gave you the respect of your people. God honored you with houses and lands and riches and blessings and influence. And now because of your unrighteousness, because of your unwillingness to do the right thing, there's a curse that's going to fall upon your family that the blood will never depart from your throne. What's my point? David needed some checkups. Because when you don't check yourself up, it doesn't matter how high, how, how high your calling is. You can fall into the abyss of anybody else. And we've seen it all, all along the line as we see the littered refuge of people that have had great gifts and great ministries and great context for business or great context for influence. And all of a sudden, because they don't check up, because they don't keep themselves in, in a place of responsibility and accountability, all of a sudden, things begin to fall apart. Things begin to ebb. Why is a checkup so important? Well, number one, because it brings early discovery and early prevention. You see, you find issues before they become real problems. That's why we do checkups. What would have happened if at the early stages, while he's sitting there contemplating, you know, I think I just want to stay home. Joab can handle this fight with the Ammonites. What if he would have all of a sudden brought that before God and said, Lord, is it okay? And God said, no, it's not okay. You're called to lead this group. You're called to take that responsibility. You're called to be the influence that does it. I want you to get up, shake yourself off, take your responsibility, do what you're supposed to do, and I will be with you. He would have subjugated this whole process. It would have never unfolded. A man wouldn't have died. A baby wouldn't have died. Corruption wouldn't have met the, the kingdom. A curse wouldn't have fallen upon his name. But he never, he wouldn't submit himself to check it. And then a little later on, when he looks at that woman, he could have said, oh, Lord, I repent. I for, forgive me. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have gone there. No, instead he took to the next step. Because that's what happens when you don't make yourself accountable. That's what happens. You don't see the indicators that say you're heading the wrong way. You need to turn around, stop your trend, and move a different direction. Oh, if you're going to clap for the Lord, clap for him. See, see, David stayed home. David stayed home. It gives you early indicators that if honestly confronted and adjusted will prevent next stage problems, right? Look what the Bible says. You know, there's actually a thing that we do in church every week that helps you with this. It's called communion. It's called communion. It's the one thing that God put within the body that gives us a, a, a literal thing that we can go to that says, examine yourself. Don't touch this until you examine yourself. Don't drink this until you examine yourself. Because if you don't do this in a worthy way, in other words, if you don't make yourself accountable to the standard, it's going to go bad for you. And so we do one of two things. We either, we either submit to that process, we commit ourselves, we let that standard develop, we, we adjust, get ourselves right with God and receive it with blessing, or we avoid it, or we eat it in an unworthy manner. In either way, it brings consequences oftentimes we don't want to deal with. Now, I know we don't preach it anymore, but it's the truth. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 11. So anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should what? Three of you are reading? Come on. That is why you should examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are what? Weak, sick, and even have died. Isn't it interesting? He says because you're not looking at the early indicators, you're experiencing consequences that you're still not paying attention to. But if you would examine yourself, we would not be judged by God in this way. What? Early prevention stops the judgments of God. What was the old, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? That's an old statement. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Here's, here's the other thing that we need to understand happens when we do checkups, right? Simple solutions instead of radical measures. Right? Oh, we're going to get this polyp before it turns into cancer. We're going to treat your gums before it turns into gingivitis. We're going we're to change your portfolio because this doesn't work anymore. 
Simple solutions. Oh, you're going to learn how to talk to your wife so that next week she doesn't divorce you. Simple solutions instead of radical measures. But too many of us let ourselves, they, we ignore it. We don't believe it'll happen to us. We feel fine about it. But because we don't have markers and standards and we're not checking it up, we're not examining, the consequences are we miss the simple solutions that if we'd have just done this, you ever been there? If I would have just listened to my doctor, if I would have just paid attention to this, if I would have just took care of that, if I would have just been listening to what I was hearing out of my kid, how would that have changed his trajectory today? If I would have just listened to what I was hearing when my wife would say, you're not listening to me. If I'd have listened to simple solutions, I wouldn't have had to go to radical measures. And checkups bring us to that place. See, David didn't identify how he was losing touch with the responsibilities of his kingdom. He didn't identify how his absence from the presence of God was affecting the way he was relating to everything else in his life. I promise you he wasn't in the presence of God. I promise you he wasn't in that tent and he wasn't before the ark. I promise you it wasn't happening. Because had he been, the Lord would have been convicting him. And that's what we do. We, we decide, you know what, I don't need to go to church today. I don't need to go to small group today. I don't need to go to that class today. I don't want to talk to them because they're going to talk to me about why I need to do this. And I just hate that when they do that to me. Because if I was to be honest with myself, I don't want to be accountable. Well, I, I'm sorry if I'm picking on you. Let's just blame God. You're glorying. First Corinthians. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Like if you just deal with this little thing before it becomes a big thing, you'll save the lump. If you'll just extract that little thing that is the problem right now, that's kind of, un, you notice it, but you don't see the effect of it. If you just get rid of that, and the, the verse in Song of Solomon, catch, catch the little foxes that spoil the vine, ruin the vine. Here's the other reason why we need to do checkups. Oh, you'll love this word, accountability. Accountability. Account what we have, what we possess, what is ours. Ability, how we use it. How we use what God's given us. How we use what belongs to us. How do we use it? We're measuring ourselves against a standard of what we need to do. So here's how we establish accountability. If, if you don't like this word, it's an important word for anybody in life, no matter where they are in life. Here you go. You ready? What's your standard? Do you have a standard for your spiritual life? Do you have a standard for your home life? Do you have a standard for your family life? Do you have a standard for your financial life? Because if you don't have a standard, you'll hit nothing. Do you, have a, do you have a standard for what you think? Do you have a standard for what you'll let yourself watch? Do you have a standard for what you'll let, where you'll let yourself go in your imaginations and your mind? Do you have a standard for the attitude that you have towards people? Thank you, Pastor. You're blessing me today. I'm so glad I came to church. <laughs> Woo! Here's the, here's the other thing that brings accountability. Who holds you to it? Well, I, I got this. No, you don't. No, you do not. You need somebody like Nathan that will say, you are that man. You need somebody that ain't going to let you get away with your stuff. You got to have somebody to look you in the eye and say, that's hogwash. You're lying to yourself. You're not being honest. You got to have somebody who'll say, isn't that third piece of cake too much? <laughs> Come on. Did, didn't you say you weren't going to do that anymore? Come on. Yeah, but I think today's an exception. No, it's not an exception. What makes it an exception? Well, I just don't feel like doing it today. Well, buck up, little camper. <laughs> Toughen up. You know, right now I'm in, a, I'm in training for worlds, and, and you know, my, my uh, professor is not nice. He's like, come on, pastor. I want to sit out one of the roles. Pastor, come on. And he doesn't pick some easy person. He gives me the animal in the room. Because he sees me at my worst. Why? Because it ain't a fight until I'm exhausted. 
You don't know what you're made of until you have to confront something when you're exhausted. That's when you find out what your mindset is. That's when you find out what your attitude is. And I need somebody that's going to push me there because I won't go there naturally. The Holy Spirit will do that for you if you're listening to him. And when the Holy Spirit ain't there, he gives you your wife. <laughs> or your husband. Or your, or your kids. Don't, some of you are looking at me, give me the evil eye. Come on now. <laughs> Finally, and this is the real key. Are you correctable and teachable? Because I'm going to tell you, the reason why most of us don't want anybody to be, make us accountable is because we aren't correctable and teachable. If there's nobody that can point to you and say, stop it, it's because you don't want to be corrected. You, don't want, you need somebody that will say, that's not the way you do that. I see how you're treating your kids, stop it. I see how you're talking to your husband, stop it. That's not the way you do this. And this is the way you do it. You need somebody in front of you who's got success. You need somebody behind you who you can help. And you need somebody beside you who understands where you're going. Yeah. Folks, and I'm going to tell you, if you're going to learn anything, because some of us are old and we're set in our ways, we need to be correctable. We need to be, just because you've been doing it a long time that way doesn't mean you were doing it right the whole time. I've always done it this way. Well, they used to spit chew into open wounds thinking that'd fix it. We've been doing that for 100 years, and, it, and people have been having their arms lopped off for 100 years. Okay. I, I don't know where that came from. Let's move on. Look at the verse. But encourage one another. This word encourage doesn't mean positive affirmation. It means instruction. It means edification. It means building something, creating something, developing something in one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you, what, may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Do you see what's happening here? Somebody's engaging you so that sin doesn't get a hold of you. Right. Good. Good. That's what it's saying. Good. Let's keep going. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So. Share each other's burdens, and this is the way to obey the law of Christ. Here's the final one. I'm done right here. How many are grateful? It identifies growth and health. You see, the reason we need to do checkups isn't just to show us what's wrong. We also need to be encouraged by what's right. Wow, I'm, doing, I'm actually getting somewhere. I've got some things that are saying I'm hitting my markers. Things are doing well. So you need to think about that. For instance, every day, you know what I do every day of my life right now? I stand on a scale. Every day, I get on a scale. And I just don't have a scale that just kind of looks at me. I have a scale that's connected to my phone. And when I stand on it, my phone goes, bing. So when I stand on it at 4.30, it wakes up everybody in the house. It tells everybody, I just stood on the scale. And now my scale is telling me not only how much I weigh, how much I lost, how much I didn't lose, it also tells me my BMI. It tells me my muscle, uh, my muscle structure. It tells me my bone density. It tells me how many calories I should eat. It tells me, you know, whether I got fungus on my toes. It tells me everything. <laughs> now, why do I stand on the scale? You know, when I stand on that scale and it goes, that means, no, it doesn't do that. But when it does, when it tells me I gained weight, does that encourage me? No. But when it goes, bing, and I've lost Two-tenths of a pound. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. I took down two-tenths. Yeah, come on. Bring it. I'm going to take down another two-tenths. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I got this. Taking that weight off. I'm going to be a lean, mean fighting machine. Yeah, baby. Why? Because success creates success. 
You know, when you, when you invest and it starts making money, you think I need to create more investments. When you start speaking into your kids and you start seeing them wanting to hang out with you, it makes you want to do more for your kids. Are you getting the point? Success breeds success. And we want to identify health and growth so that we can continue to succeed. God's got us on the right track. We're doing the right things. It's working. I shared Jesus with somebody. I made a decision, I'm going to share Jesus this week. And I share it with somebody, and they receive Christ. I get excited. I want to share not just with one person, now two people, now three people. Something's motivating me. I'm making an impact. I want to help somebody. And they actually get help, and they text me back, say, I couldn't have made it through this week without you. You go, yes, Lord, I'm doing something that's making a difference. There's measurable, measurable results for the victory that God's creating in our life. Woo! Identify your markers. Here's the final one. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Come on, everybody needs regular checkups. So, Father, right now, I ask you to just speak into our spirits and our hearts. I ask you to just download the truth and the blessing of where you want to take us in every area of our life. I know there are people sitting in this room right now that just feel overwhelmed. They feel overwhelmed with all the stuff that they see is wrong or all the stuff they see that needs to get fixed. Lord, I, I, we're not here to pile on. We're just asking you, Father, to give them the grace to know how to be proactive and not just reactive, to make a decision today to do something about it. They don't have to fix it all today, but to do something about it. To not surrender one more inch to their flesh or to the enemy. But Lord, to begin to take back the ground that you want them to have for their homes, for their finances, for their hearts, for their mindset, and for their spirit. Lord, I'm asking you to break down walls today and barriers today that says that we can't. Lord, I want you to affirm your word in each and every one in this room that they can do all things through Christ who strengthens them. I'm asking you for miracles of grace that will fall upon people as they make these decisions, as they move forward and change the trajectory. Lord, I thank you that today there is enough. There's enough grace, there's enough patience, there's enough blessing for them to come through victorious. So we're trusting you for that very work right now, right now as we pray. For those that are online that are struggling with it themselves, I'm asking you to download that grace into their spirits. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.